Are you ready? Yes. All right. Enthusiastic group. I always like that. Uh, have you been... Uh, fearful about what's happening in the world around you. Maybe you're living in fear because you see what's happening and, and uh, in our government and in our country and in the world. Uh, if you are, be here tomorrow night for the message. Open your eyes. And I hope you'll be encouraged in the last night to die like Elisha. Come and find out what that's all about. I hope you'll be here. But for tonight... Where did it fall? Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Kind of happy it's not as long a reading as I had last night. <laughs> now the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, See, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan and each of us get there a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, Go. Then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water, and he cried, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. Let's pray. Father, just to add again to Brother Malcolm's prayer, I do ask that our hearts would be open and really receptive to your truth. That your truth will mean nothing to us if we don't receive it and put it deep into our hearts and our lives. And Father, I pray for each one of us that right now we'll set aside anything that's, any burden that's besetting us and just take in your word of truth. You knew long before tonight who would be here and what this message would be, long before I knew what this message would be. And so Father, we are here for a purpose. This is not an accident. Revive our hearts, revive our spirits, revive our souls, Father. And Father, we thank you. Because we know you're answering this prayer even as we speak it. As you touch my tongue and my lips and bring forth your word, we say amen in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Well, in our text, the prophet Elisha was visiting a school for prophets. I kind of think of a Bible college maybe, you know. Was, he's visiting there and the school was going through some growing pains. Any school likes to go through growing pains usually. We look again at verse 1. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. So willing workers headed to the forest for building materials. And again, let's take a look at verses 2 to 4 again. Let us go to the Jordan and each of us get there a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, Go. Then one of them said, Be, be pleased to go with your servants. And he said, I will go. So he went with them and when they came to the Jordan they cut down some trees. Growing pains, we don't have any place we've got to build a dormitory. So let's, get to, let's get together and we'll just build it ourselves. And uh, say, Elisha, wouldn't you like to come along with us, teacher? And, and lend a hand or give us some direction and spend some time with us, fellowship with us. Sure, I'll do that. Now, while cutting down trees, <clears throat> one of the students had this problem. The iron head on the axe he was using flew off the handle and landed in the water. And he didn't, he didn't just lose an axe head. He lost a borrowed axe head. Now you have to consider, this is a Bible college student. He didn't have any money. And how's he going to pay for that, for that borrowed axe head? I mean, this is a terrible thing. It's iron. How are you going to pay for that? So he called out to Elisha for help in verse 5. He said, alas, my master, it was borrowed. I'm sure they heard the splash. He said, it was borrowed. What am I going to do? now. I can't go out there and get that. What's going to happen? And the prophet then asked the student a very important question. A question that he had to know the answer to if Elisha was going to help him. If he was ever going to get that axe head back. Then the man of God said, 
where did it fall? You know, this was not just a question for Old Testament times. It's a question which must be answered in our own day and time. Church, we are living in a fallen world. And if you don't know that, you're out of touch with what's going on around you. Or maybe you're not walking in the Christian life and you just don't know what the difference between light and darkness is. Our thinking has changed. Right is wrong and wrong is right. Light is dark and dark is light. During a class trip to a local pool, one of Teacher Jan's first grade students misplaced her towel. That night, Jan received a frantic call from the girl's mother who said that someone had stolen her daughter's towel. Trying to calm her down, Jan asked her to describe the towel. Just describe it to me, she said. And the mother answered, it's gray, she snapped, with Hyatt Regency written all over it. <laughs> we don't seem to have a sense of right and wrong. If it's right for us, it's right. If it's wrong for us, it's wrong. Where did it fall? This is a question for the whole human race. The world is in trouble, isn't it? And I'm not just talking about one area of the world gets in trouble and it seems to get patched up in another area. We've got countries on the borders of other countries getting ready, we think, maybe to attack. We don't know what's going to happen next. The world is just in a mess. There seems to be no end to it. Hatred, greed, crime, violence, a quenchless thirst for power and sensuality. What happened? What happened? Where did this long road begin? Where did it fall? Well, the answer is really pretty simple. It all started with Adam and Eve. Or we should, maybe we should say Eve and Adam because it kind of, well, I don't want to get into all that and get myself in trouble. But if you know the story, uh, Genesis chapter 3, you can read all about it and figure it out for yourself and draw your own opinion. But it's all there. Adam and Eve were selfish and prideful. And they believed the lies of Satan that they could be like God. That they could actually be just as God as their Creator was. And they could make decisions like their Creator did. They believed that they could be on the same level as their Creator God. And we've fallen right along in their footsteps, haven't we? And there have been periods in the history of the world where it seems like the world was going more that way than at other times, but it certainly seems like it's going that way now. We believe that we have the right to give life and to take life away. 156.6 million abortions are performed worldwide every day. Every day. That means 219 babies die for every 1,000 born. We are playing God. We are playing God. Euthanasia or assisted suicide is legal and on the rise around the world. You say, well, an adult, maybe they could make that decision. I... Columbia sets the age requirement for assisted suicide at six years old. Six years old! The Netherlands at 12 and Switzerland and Belgium have no age requirements whatsoever. So I guess assisted suicide could just be extended abortion. We are playing God. My friends, redemption is the only answer. It's, it's, it's not, I, I know every four years everybody puts their hope in maybe a new administration and something's going to, oh, it's going to be bad this time or it's going to be good that time. And people get all worked up about it. And certainly sometimes things can get a little better under one administration than under another. Yes, but that's not the answer. Politics is not the answer. Redemption is the only answer. Fallen people must be born again. Fallen people must be made new. And there's not going to be any hope until that happens. The only way this can be accomplished is through the blood that 
excuse me, that Christ shed on the cross of Calvary. There is no other way. All other remedies are going to fail. They're just going to fail. Men have been trying it for years. We think we know how to handle this crime problem. Or we know how to handle this problem of death and, and all the things that are happening. No, redemption is the only answer. C.S. Lewis, always one of my favorite authors, said this about redemption. It is not an abstraction called humanity that is to be saved. It is you, your soul, that, is, that was made for the high and holy place. It's not humanity that abstracts it. It is you. Your soul was made for that high and holy place. All that you are, every fold and crease of your individuality was devised from all eternity to fit God as a glove fits a hand. According to Genesis 1.27, you were made in God's image. Therefore, you should fit Him like a glove. Are you a glove that doesn't fit? Are you one of those who has fallen and can't get up? You need to come to Christ. You need the redemptive blood of Jesus to cover your soul. It's the only answer. It is. This isn't a mean old preacher just saying you got to be like me or anything. I'm just saying. I'm just saying the only answer to your problems, the only answer to my problems is the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians 1 7 says, In him, meaning Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our tres trespasses according to the riches, riches of his grace. Where did it fall? This is a question for our nation. I thank God for America. I really do. And I thank God for all you veterans who fought to keep this land free. I'm a very patriotic person, always have been. Love this nation. But we cannot ignore the fact that we have some very serious problems here. Very serious problems. People killing people at school, at work, in the church house, at home, in the abortion mills, over 62 million in the U.S. since 1973, 62 million. And people are saying to me all the time, I just don't know why, I, you know, and I don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat, they say, I don't know why we can't get somebody with good sense in the White House. Well, maybe we aborted that one. You know what? We've killed so many. Maybe some of those who should have been there now or should have been there in the last several years, maybe they just didn't make it past that. And euthanasia now legal in many parts of our own country. Look it up. Crime, AIDS, alcoholism, drugs, and divorce, everywhere you look. Political conventions where God is booed, who would ever thought that? Politicians who refuse to acknowledge the power, love, and grace of God. During the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, when it was all getting going, uh, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo refused God any credit for reversing the terrible death rate in his state at one point. The number is down because we brought the number down, he told reporters. God did not do that. Faith did not do that. Destiny did not do that. We did that. During the same time, I'll go home with this one. In Mississippi, a Mississippi mayor handed out $500 fines to Christians who attended a drive-in worship service. $500 tickets. They said only 10 people can be in the church house, and there were only 10 in there, and they set up an AM radio feed, and these people wanted to be at midweek Bible study. So they drove their cars, kept their windows up, and tuned in their radios to hear their preacher, whoever their Bible teacher was. And the mayor sent the city police there. And they knocked on the windows, and the only time that those people ever had direct contact with anybody was when the police had them roll down their windows and talk to them, and gave them $500 tickets. I thank God our governor said, tear them up. We're not doing that in this state. 
I haven't lived in Mississippi all my life, but I've come to love a lot of things about Mississippi. But to think, I never would have thought I would have seen that in the middle of the Bible Belt, in the buckle of the Bible Belt. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio threatened to close down houses of worship permanently if they would not abide by his lockdown measures. And when Knoxville, Tennessee city leaders finally agreed to let Christians go back to their church buildings, it was with many restrictions, including banning communion. This is what the city officials told the churches that had communion. That would be like church. They said, instead of having communion, just have everybody sit there and think about it. It'll mean a whole lot more to them. Well, I want you to know I always, go to, I always go to government officials to get my spiritual advice. No, I take communion. Last year when our partner, Brother Greg, or maybe it was the year before in 2020, was coming to California and they were saying, you don't meet. You don't meet in your church house. He called the church in Barstow and he said, what are you going to do? They said, we're having church. Not only are we having church, if you'll get out here, we're having revival. And they had a powerful revival that year in Barstow. And that's what we told people. And I, I, will, I will go along, and I'm saying this online, and I've said it online before. You can, you've got my address. They can follow me anywhere and come get me. But I will follow the law of this land as long as it does not contradict this book. Amen. But I will be in God's house, and I, if it's only me, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be around the Lord's table, and I'm going to be there. There's a reason that God's Word says, do not forsake the assembly of yourselves together. Because you forsake long enough, and you're going to forget. We come around this table in remembrance of Him. And we don't come around this table, we, we start forgetting, don't we? So I'm going to be here. I'm just weak enough I could start forgetting, I'm afraid, if I didn't have that time around here. So I'm going to be here. I'm going to do this. And someone said, well, why do they put you in jail? <laughs> then I got a captive audience. I got an example. I got a Bible example in the New Testament. Boy, I know how to do that. I know how to handle that one. In churches in our country, leaving Scripture to become relevant to the world. You know, well, we can't have a cross. That's offensive. Of course it is. It was always meant to be offensive. And no, we, can't, we, can't really talk, we can't really talk about particular sins because it will offend people. Of course it will offend people because it will take them to hell. Let's talk about it. It's in the Word of God. We have to talk about it. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want anybody's feelings. I'm not a, contra, uh, a, a type of person who likes to confront people. But the Word of God confronts us. It confronts me all the time. And if I love you, then I'm going to tell you what it says. Yeah. I'm going to love you enough to care about it. And if you don't want to do anything about it, then that's your choice. And I'll love you anyway. I'm not going to hate you if you're not going to do anything about it. But church is leaving Scripture to become relevant to the world, putting programming above the Word of God. Building an audience rather than the body of Christ. Barnum and Bailey proved that any clown can build an audience. But my friends, only God can build His church. And He does it when His people preach and teach the rock solid Word of God. Amen. Acts 2.47, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Church, it's time we do what's right. Amen. Not what's easy, but what's right. We need to hear Elisha's question, where did it fall? And it's time we quit fooling ourselves. It's time we give an honest answer. It fell when Americans accepted the lies of Satan. That prayer, Bible reading, the Ten Commandments are bad things to have in our public schools and to teach our children. The nations have sunk in the pit that they made. In the net that they hid, their own foot has been caught. Psalm 915, does that talk about anybody you know? When we accept this... That God had no place in the public life or policy of our nation. When we accept that that's where we've come to. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Psalm 9, 17. 
And someone says, oh, our nation's too great. Our nation is the finest nation on the face of this earth in my mind. But there have been other fine nations that God turned into hell and destroyed. Let's not think too highly of ourselves. That our mind and bodies belong to us and God has no say in the matter. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God? You are not your own for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And that our church houses are places to entertain the crowds rather than to make disciples of Jesus Christ. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed, 2 Peter 2, 1 and 2. That puts us right back with Adam and Eve, doesn't it? Selfishness, pride, and a firm belief that we can be our own God. Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. And that's just the fact. We need revival in this land. We need revival in this country. We need to get back to the basics. We need to get on our knees in prayer at church, at home, at work, and at school. And we need to pray that God will forgive us and take us back before it's too late. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. 1 Chronicles 7.14 We've got to get back in prayer. You know, I tell preachers when they talk about what do we do to prepare for revival, and, and there's a lot of things you can do and announcements and, and on the web and everything, but the one thing I say is most important is prayer. That's the packet we send out, be sure you pray, and we suggest things like cottage prayer, small group prayers, and houses and prayer chains and everything else. And some preachers tell me our people just won't show up. They won't do it. And I always tell them the first thing, you, you, the one thing you don't want to do is tell them the next Sunday, the Sunday before revival, there won't be preaching, it's going to be a prayer service. Because people are going to say, it's just a prayer service, we're not going to go. We might have to spend there some time being quiet and talking to God and listening to Him. We need to start talking to God and listening to Him and having prayer services again. Some of us are old enough to remember that they used to call it midweek prayer service. Maybe we need to institute that again. Where did it fall? This is also a question for everyone who remembers a better day in their Christian walk. Do you remember that? You started out so well in your Christian life. The joy of your salvation. Your desire to serve wherever Christ could use you. Your strong, unfailing love and devotion to Jesus. Your longing to do His will. Your hunger for the Bible. You couldn't wait to get to Bible study. Because you just were learning so much. It was all brand new. And the joy of the Christian fellowship. And your desire for others to know your Lord. To tell them about the, your, your family you found at church. And you want you to, oh please come and be with me. Where did it fall? If it did. Maybe it did in your life, but if it did fall in your life, where did it fall? How, how did you become so lukewarm? What was the reason for your decline? Was it a disagreement or disillusionment with a brother or sister in Christ? Was it pressure at work? Did your pride get in the way? Or did you just become selfish somewhere down the line. Putting yourself, your own desires, your own wants, your own needs above your devotion to God, your love for Jesus, and your service to others. Sometimes it just happens, you know? It just does. You're not a, if it happened to you, 
it doesn't mean you're an evil person. It just happened. Just slowly, you didn't see it coming. Now you look at yourself and say, that, that's, that's where I'm at. I didn't see it coming. Don't you think it's time you put first things first? Amen. Don't you think it's time to come back home where you belong? Come back to your first love, Jesus. The Ephesian Christians had left their first love. And Jesus had a word for them in Revelation 2.5. He said, Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So he would say to you, if you find yourself in that position, it's time to come home. You know, repentance is just turning around. And you've been walking away from, from Jesus and your home with God's family and just getting further and further away. Maybe you're still attending church, but mentally and spiritually you're getting further and further away. You're walking away and repentance is just turning around. That's all it is. So turn around and head home. You know, it would have been a, a sad day if that poor student who'd lost that borrowed axe head had not been able to recover it. Poor fella, you know. It would have been a, a poor ending to this story. I don't like to have poor endings to the story. I, I, like, I like, and they lived happily ever after. I've always liked that kind of thing. It, and it would be a sad day for us and for our nation. Indeed, for the whole human race, if we had to remain where we've fallen, Amen. if there were no hope that we could be retrieved. But let, let's go back to our story. Verse 6, Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. We see first the student had to acknowledge where it had fallen. Then Elisha threw the stick in the water and the iron axe head floated to the top. And you see God expects the same thing of us. We have to acknowledge that we have fallen and where we have fallen. We have to admit that we have sinned. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're not out there by yourself. All of us have sinned. But we have to admit that. And then He will apply the wood. Only God uses two pieces of wood which are quite a bit larger. And they are in the form of a cross. And they are covered in the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Would you notice one more thing with me? The student acknowledged where it fell. Elisha applied the wood and the axe had floated to the top, but it still wasn't saved. Look at verse 7. And he said, Take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. <coughs> the man had to reach out his hand and take it. It was all right there. The salvation was there. He acknowledged it, but he needed to do something about it. And we must do the same thing. <clears throat> That's what we have to do. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew 16, 24. So, if you are a Christian and you've fallen, you can get up. The cross, the wood, was applied. Now you just have to reach out and take it. It's there for you to come home. It's there for you. But you've got to be resolved that this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. And you've got to stick with it. And if you're not a Christian, well, the blood's been applied. The wood, the cross, it's been applied. But just because it's been applied doesn't mean there's salvation. You've got to reach out and take it. And that means you've got to believe that Jesus Christ shed His blood and died for you. That He was buried and rose again. He's coming again. 
And you need to make that confession because confession is made unto salvation. We are told in the Scriptures. And you've got to repent because unless you repent you'll all likewise perish, Jesus said. And I've already told you what that is. Turn around and come to Jesus. And then you must be buried with Christ in the water grave of baptism and raised to walk in a brand new life. Saul was told, and why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Call in the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16. And I'd say that to you, and why do you wait? It's there. The wood has been applied. Reach out and take it. Be resolved tonight that you're going to live for Jesus. Let's not only decide, let's sing about it and let's do it as we stand together and make our decision for Jesus Christ.